Good morning. I'm so glad you're here. We welcome all of you this morning, especially those that are listening online as well, because we love it to know when our online is with us, and we are just happy that they can join in that way. I'd like to welcome any first-time visitors this morning, and if you would, fill out the yellow card in front of you in the pew rack and take it out to the Welcome Center after the service this morning, and because um, we do want to uh, welcome you as well. There are multiple things in our uh, bulletin, so if you haven't gotten one of those, they're outside on the desk, and please get one before you leave here today, I, especially because the prayer list is in the middle, and we do want to be praying for um, our members, our friends, our family, our community, and there's a list of those there that you can take with you and pray over this week. I, again, I'm just so glad that you're here with us this morning. And as you stand and greet each other this morning, just let them know that God loves them, and so do you. Stand and welcome each other. Let's remain standing this morning as we sing victory in Jesus. Sweet. 
you guys all here today. Um, for our offering today, we want to focus on something that's special that's going to be happening next Saturday, or this coming Saturday. Um, from 4.30 to 6.30, we have our father-daughter dance that we've started up again. And so we are so excited to see um, the, the value and encourage the value of families. Uh, and so we encourage you guys to come. Actually, it says 4 to 6, um, so sorry about that. Um, I encourage you guys to get your tickets, bring your daughters, gentlemen, granddaughters, Come on out. We're going to have, you know, dancing and fun. And the theme is ties and tiaras. So lots of princesses and what? Okay, so there is a potential change of date if the weather is sour. So we're just going to pray that the weather's good. So, but we are excited. I encourage you guys to do that. This is a great opportunity to come, though. And, and even if you don't have children nearby, come and join. I'm sure we have plenty of other kids that will be more than happy to adopt you for the evening. So I encourage you guys to do that. We, we want to push the value of family. Um, it's a very important part of, uh, of who we are as Christians, as bo both the broader uh, biblical family, but also the actual biological family too. So I encourage you guys to do that. For, for prayer today, though, for offering, um, I do have a couple of prayer requests. Um, one, we pray for Brian for safe travel as he is at his grandfather's funeral up in Iowa. Uh, so we pray for safe travels for him this weekend. Uh, but also Bill Harold. Um, so Bill was supposed to actually do communion. He was all excited about it, was praying about it, was ready. Uh, we met on Friday. And then on Saturday, he's had a, a, an illness from uh, dialysis. And so he's pretty sick right now, and they're not totally sure what they're going to do about that. So we want to definitely keep Bill in our prayers today. Um, as he is trying to figure out what we want to do with that going forward. So, if you please, guys, bow your heads. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the little bit warmer day that it is this morning. We thank you for the, the value of families and how we can celebrate that um, with simple dances and, and, and dinners. Lord, we thank you for the, the, the church body and how it comes along and leans upon one another and lifts one another up. Lord, we do pray for safe travel for Brian as he's returning home from Iowa uh, at the loss of his grandfather. And Lord, we pray for Bill as he is uh, trying to figure out how to proceed forward with his dialysis, Lord. We just ask for, for guidance and wisdom from the doctors and for healing, Lord. 
And Lord, we lift up any other concerns in our church body today that aren't mentioned. Lord, we ask that you would take this offering, that you would multiply it, to let us be able to spread out the kingdom of God in our community. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. first told me that we were doing controversial issues at the time it was with Peter, now it's and Peter, he gave me several options. Uh, there was about five different options, and, and I saw this one, I thought, I want this one. It's relationships and intimacy. You know, go big or go home, right? Um, so we're going to talk, a little, there's a lot to talk about with relationships, though, but one of the first thing is this little, you know, thought here. What's the difference between love and marriage? Anybody guys think guesses? Guesses? Love is blind, and marriage is an eye-opener. <laughs> love, love is blind, and marriage is an eye-opener. <laughs> All of us married couples here understand that one. It's amazing how much you learn about your spouse once you're with them all the time. 
uh, and, and all their quirks that go along with that. But you know, relationships are f- a foundational need that we all have. It was something given to us by God, a desire that we want to find ways to fill in that. Maybe it's a relationship between a husband and wife. Maybe it's a parent and their child. The relationship between two very close friends. Even the relationship between an employer and an employee. We all deeply desire to be connected to those around us in one capacity or another. In fact, going back to the very beginning of the Bible, The first time God says that something was not good with his creation was in Genesis 2, 18 through 25. He just created Adam, and he made all of these animals and said, all right, Adam, you've got a job. Go and name these animals. And as he steps back and he's kind of looking, he's like, you know what? Something's missing. Adam needs a relationship. He needs a support. He needs someone to be there when when things get down that he can lean upon. Also, he needs someone that he can laugh with and show off his accomplishments with. God recognized and put in us this need for relationships. And if you think about it, what makes relationships so valuable and so important is our simple need for intimacy. You see, intimacy is a closeness between two people that is developed over time uh, through shared opportunities and experiences, some good, some dark. It's a development of a high level of trust and a relationship with a lot of depth and honesty. And then intimacy starts to develop. You see, God created our need for intimacy with others to develop in us a model so that we can learn how to have intimacy with God. I believe he places people in our lives that can become models of how he wants to be in a relationship with us, that need for intimacy. He wants us to trust him deeply, to have a relationship filled with depth, and to be fully honest with him. Ultimately, God desires an intimate relationship with all of us. Yet here's the problem. Anytime God does something good, the father of lies finds a way to twist it, to shape it, to mold it, to warp it, to run it. And one of those things is intimacy. You see, in our culture, there was another definition for intimacy. That's the first one that a lot of us comes up with. But this definition of intimacy is physical, it's carnal, and it's often selfishly focused. The reality is the world believes the lie that a physical relationship is equivalent with true intimacy. You've probably heard the phrases, just do what feels right. And the other phrase, love is love. There's a danger, though, to these kind of ideas. And we see these lies being told in the media. We see it in our literature, in music, in the political arenas, and even in higher education now. But this idea, this concept of intimacy becomes watered down until it loses all value. If intimacy is just the physical, then it's nothing. There's no merit. This idea of intimacy is actually detrimental to us. It will affect our mental health. Uh, Studies show that men and women that have multiple one-night stands are both 18% more likely to be suicidal. The lack of intimacy and just the physicality of a relationship is disturbing to the mental health. And they can't, argue, they can't say exactly what causes what, but psychologists believe that there is a dual relationship there, that they both are impacting one another. Going along, it also is detrimental to our relationships with others. 
Dr. John Van Epp, who's a, a great uh, marriage therapist who wrote the book, How to Avoid Marrying a Jerk. It's a very good book, by the way. Noted that couples with the most struggles in counseling were the ones that were physically active before they were deeply committed to one another. They confused physical intimacy with true intimacy. It's also detrimental to our spiritual health. We, we have examples all over the Bible. Samson, David, Solomon. They allowed the physical to impact their spiritual health. And ultimately, Peter acknowledges this very discrepancy in 1 Peter 4, 1 through 4. Our scripture today is this. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same resolve, because anyone who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Consequently, he does not live out his remaining time on earth for human passions, but for the will of God. Going on. For you have spent enough time in the past carrying out the same desires as the Gentiles, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Because of this, they consider it strange of you not to plunge with them into the same flood of reckless indiscretion, and they heap abuse upon you. All right, nice uplifting scripture there, right? Woo! Makes you feel good inside, doesn't it? But, but here's the reality. Peter starts out this verse discussing how Christ was and is the perfect example of an intimate relationship with, Christ, with, with God, his Father. You see, Christ walked the earth bringing glory to his Father. In fact, he says in John 17, 4, in one of his great prayers, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the the uh, work you gave me to do. You see, Jesus, in both work and deed and in, in, in speech, he modeled what true intimacy with God looks like. It is all based on submitting to God's will and continuing to look to God for our needs and our purpose. Like Christ, we are called to live not for human passions, but for the will of God. Think about that. We are called not for human passions, but for the will of God. We are called to live as a new creation, one that's not bound by our past choices, our past follies, our past screw-ups. Not bound by our past lack of knowledge, but one that is changed from the inside out, made new, heading towards perfection. Peter then goes and shows how the deceived world lives their life. It's one, as he lists off, filled with debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. You see, when Peter is, is writing this, he's living in a culture that the physical carnal mentality is prime. The Roman culture viewed sex similar to the world today, actually. The reality is there are no new sins. There's just new ways to market old sins. Sex was used in worship of certain pagan deities in this culture. In fact, the temple of Aphrodite in Corinth was known for temple prostitution. That was their form of worship. To their god or goddess but today we just change the god or goddess today sex is used in the worship of self it's still the same altar the still the same destructive idea but we say just do what feels right the culture of the roman culture was also all about lavish lifestyle and carnal living in fact, Pompeii, Italy, you know, the place where Mount Vesuvius, the big explosion of the, the volcano, and it covered the city, killing the city. Well, 
Archaeologists have been excavating that for decades. And they have, over, they have uncovered over 25 brothels in that one city. With murals painting different acts, different activities. You see, their goal was always just do what feels right. There are no consequences. Why does it matter? Ultimately, their selfish desires were the primary motiv motivating factor for the people. They just wanted to fulfill their physical desires by any means necessary. And yet, we see this very culture today in our community and in the world. Yet here's the thing, it doesn't stay this way. It doesn't have to stay this way. That's the whole reason why Christ came. Christ came to change the rules of the world. Now there's, a, now there's an opportunity to make a decision. You see, Peter reveals that the past fleshly, selfish living is not how we are called to live today. You're a new creation. But this idea boggles the mind of the world. It confuses them. It makes them feel less than. So then they turn around and they insult us. They call us prudes or goody two-shoes or self-righteous. You see, they reject our idea of intimacy and they think we're the ones that are wrong. Yet, they don't seem happy. They say that we're the ones that are old-fashioned and yet, they're the ones that are doing behaviors that predate Christ. The reality is, though, they're not happy inside. Living this way causes a deep sense of emptiness. It causes a myriad of mental health issues, depression, anxiety. It causes a path of broken relationships, one relationship after another, after another, after another. You see, they're seeking something, but they can never find it. Ultimately, it begins to skew the view of one's value. You start to look at yourself as less than, as broken, as having no value. But the reality is, God don't make trash. But people's choices can make us feel like trash. You see, Peter recognized that this path is a deadly flood of reckless indiscretion. You think about a flood. A flood comes in and it stirs up all of the trash and the debris and it deposited it everywhere. And their lifestyle becomes like a flood. To kind of switch gears for a little bit, God is called holy over 400 times in the Bible. Over and over we hear God is holy, 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 holy. But you know that God is called love only one time? It's in a passage in 1 John, and it actually uses the same God is love twice. But 400 times God is holy, and two times God is love. But if you think about our culture, we love to spout, God is love, God is love, God is love. And, and you would think that it's reversed. That the holiness is under the love. But here's the thing. God is absolutely love. There is no doubt about that. But we have to recognize that he is holy first. And it is through his holiness that he wants us to have an intimate relationship with him. With a, with a foundation based on truth, lived out in love. You see, here's the thing though. God calls us to be holy also. To live to a higher standard. To not settle for the world's ideas. 
Earlier in Peter's letter, he declares in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, but just as, just as he who, is call, who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. You see, there's a standard there that has to be met. Now, now the beauty of it is we're never going to meet it in our own strength. But as a new creation, we don't have to do it in our own strength. We are called to stand for truth. Sometimes that's uncomfortable. Sometimes that makes people angry because the world doesn't get it. But we are also called to love well. There has to be a balance. Despite our differences, we still love them. Despite not agreeing on everything, we still love them. Because the reality is, all of us are created by God, and all of us have messed up. To seek true intimacy with our Heavenly Father, we've got a great example of it in the Gospels. All we have to do is look to Jesus. Jesus didn't pull his punches. He called sin, sin. But he also loved extravagantly. One of my favorite stories is the story of the adulterous woman. She's dragged in by the rabbis. Now, here's the thing. These rabbis say they caught her in the act. How did they know that that's what she was going to be doing? And they didn't bring in the gentleman. They just brought in the broken woman. And they throw her down at the feet of Jesus in front of this crowd. It's like, she screwed up, Jesus. Now, the law says we're supposed to throw stones at her. What are you going to do? And I'm sure that Jesus pauses for a second as he looks at her. And he sees this broken, defeated, shame-filled woman. And he just has compassion for her and probably annoyance for the religious. The ones that set up this farce. But he gets down, he writes something on the ground, and it never says what he wrote. You know, some say maybe it was a list of sins. Maybe he was writing out his lunch menu. I don't know. We don't know. But he just writes something in the dirt. And finally, he stands up. And he kind of looks around. Says, all right, tell you what. Whoever here is free of sin, throw the first stone. And then the older leaders kind of grumble and they drop their rocks and they slowly walk away. Because they've lived the longest, they've recognized their own sins. Probably some in the act of what they're dealing with right now. Then the middle-aged rabbis follow along and finally the youngest rabbis, the, the new ones, they leave too. And then Jesus looks at her and says, where are your condemners? Where are the ones that are accusing you of this? And she says, they've gone. And ironically enough, the only one that had the right to throw the first stone didn't pick one up. And he looks at her and says, neither do I. Now go and sin no more. We have to make a decision. Will we choose God's holiness or we cave to the world's lies? There's always only ever been two decisions, two choices, since the garden. Obey me, don't obey me. It's the same today. Today is a time of communion, though. It's a beautiful time for us to realign our hearts and minds to the amazing, holy nature of God. When we, when we sat at this table, 
We can't do it in a haughty spirit, in an arrogance, because none of us deserve to be at this table. None of us have earned it. None of us are holy enough to get this. But it's because God wants to do a cleansing work in us that he opens this table to everyone. It doesn't matter if you're broken, if you're hurt, deceived, you feel unworthy, this table is open for you. The only requirement that it has to eat at this table is a willing heart to have an intimate encounter with God today. If you can say yes to wanting an intimate relationship with God, then I encourage you wholeheartedly, come to this table today. I'm going to go ahead and invite my, my servers up. You will all be invited to walk up the center aisle and take the sacraments. The kneeling rails are open for prayer if you need those. Uh, I do encourage you guys that will you please walk back along the side aisles and, and place the, the glass cups in the baskets gently um, so we will reuse, reuse those again. You know, I think at the communion table, when we read the story of the Last Supper, I think it's very telling that the person sitting next to Jesus is Judas. Judas that will, will betray him in a matter of hours is seated next to Jesus Christ. And then when Jesus offered communion, it wasn't just to those that, he, that were standing up and standing righteous, but it was Judas. You see, Jesus took the bread, and he broke it, knowing that in a matter of hours, his body would be broken, whipped, hung to a cross take the world's curse. And he looked at him and says, take this bread and know that it's my body that's broken for you. And then later, he took the cup. Again, thinking about the blood that he would spill for his friends, for his enemies, for you and I. He says, every time you eat, drink this in remembrance of me. Lord, you are holy, and we are not. But we thank you, Lord, that you have given us a path opportunity to have an intimate relationship with you. Lord, as we take this meal today, may it be food for our very souls. It'll change us from the inside out. That when we're broken, we gain healing. Our hurt turns to joy. Our sadness becomes rejoicing. Lord, we just thank you for this day. And we thank you for your ultimate sacrifice. And then we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.
Our closing hymn says this, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he can love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful. And my song is going to ever be of my Savior's love for me. Let's stand as we sing. bless us this week. Let us be a light into the darkness as we reflect your light to others. Let your grace pour down on upon us. And then we pray. And other people said,